Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School today. Family seasons is our topic. Let's begin in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the family ties that we have. Jesus has made this gift possible. We pray that you'll bless us as we study our lesson today, identifying some themes of the 1888 message that warm our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Lesson number four is entitled, When Alone. Uh, we here live near Interstate 80, which is an extremely busy cross-country freeway, and we live near its western terminus in a very urban setting. And so our newspapers often tell of tragic truck crashes. And one most poignant is of Bruce Caldwell, 48 years old from far away Minnesota, who was nearing the end of his weary run with daughters Sarah, seven, and Abby, two and a half. They were riding with Daddy in the, in the cab when at 3 a.m. his big rig clipped the back of another truck and flipped and burst into flames. And now the grieving widow and bereaved mother is suddenly starkly alone. Probably some well-meaning pastor or friend quoted the Bible where Job says, The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. And now, perk up, dear lady, people usually say, and finish the quotation, Blessed be the name of the Lord, Job 121. The fact that the words are in the Bible and in the poetic King James Version makes many assume that they are divinely inspired. But only half of that couplet is truth. The other half is a monster lie. Just read the context. True, the Lord gave all that this dear lady had, a husband and two delightful little fun-loving daughters, all that made life happy for her and the home coming back to Minnesota, a longed-for event, but it was Satan, not the Lord, who taketh away. The story of Job makes it very plain. If I were the lady's pastor, what empty platitudes could I say? Well, something that every human needs to think about, whether still basking in the sunlit enjoyment of what the Lord gave, or grieving over what Satan has taken away. The Son of God became one of us, fully human, while relinquishing the prerogatives of his divinity, and suffered the ultimate quintessential loneliness and pain of our forsakenness. It wasn't a momentary end of consciousness, but a protracted anguish, while Jesus lost the sense of his Father's fatherhood, and he cried, My God, why have you forsaken me? Whom have I in heaven but thee? cries David, Psalm 73, 25. It's good in our daily rejoicing in all that the Lord gave us to remember that we have the ultimate treasure, treasure in him only. And so take note of that good news today. To be alone is something all of us naturally fear. So God's promise is precious. We read in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man can do to me. But of course there is a condition. We are not to leave the Lord nor forsake him. The context of God's promise is clear. It is good that the heart be established by grace, verse 9. It will always be by grace. That grace will motivate us to be loyal to Christ, even if we must stand alone in doing so. Jesus suffered alone outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach alone, verses 12 and 13. God is not paying back and forth with us, refusing to stay with us unless we stay with him. We don't take that initiative. It is he who does. But it is not fair. Well, it's impossible for us to appreciate or realize the presence of God with us unless we appreciate his grace 
in saving us from the hell that ultimate loneliness will be. When we appreciate how Jesus suffered for us alone, we're motivated to be loyal to him, even when it seems we are alone in doing so. Peter felt himself alone that Thursday night, warming himself by the fire while Jesus was being scourged inside the courtroom, so he wanted to be considered in with the crowd of giddy, thoughtless people. It hurt to be alone, but all of God's people, high or low, have somehow been tested so they can demonstrate their loyalty to Christ under stress and apparent loneliness. You can never be happy in heaven without that test. It may well be when we come to the closing scenes that God's people will each of us stand utterly alone in receiving the seal of God when everybody else appears to be receiving the mark of the beast. Elijah was alone on Mount Carmel when it seemed everybody else was either worshiping Baal or was too cowardly to stand with him when the test came. There in Kings, 1 Kings 18, it's true there were 7,000 in Israel who had not bowed their knees to Baal, but in that great test, not one had the courage to raise his hand to support Elijah. Elijah's great loyalty and loneliness had something to do with the great honor given him in being translated. And there will be 144,000 in the end who will be as loyal as Elijah was, not because they are made of sterner stuff than the rest of us and are strong, but because of their weakness. They have been identified with Jesus. They have identified themselves with Jesus as he suffered alone for them. The Apostle Paul must have been married or he could not have been a member of the Sanhedrin Council, but we know he was single when he was serving as an apostle. 1 Corinthians 9.5 it must have been that dear sister Paul walked out on him when he decided to fall, follow lowly Jesus, for he tells us he lost everything when he made that choice. Philippians 3.8, he says, I am, considered, I, I am considering everything lost for Christ Jesus. His wife very likely was in the highest social circles of Jewish life. Although she forsook him, he remained true to her until the Roman soldier's acts ended his loneliness. He knew something about love that never faileth. 1 Corinthians 13.8 Consider Paul as holy as you wish, but he was still a human being while on those long missionary journeys painfully alone. He had to watch those other happy couples almost everywhere while he had to finish his each, each of his days in solitude. And he probably couldn't help noticing a number of single attractive women here and there as well. Christ never intended that service for him meant that a man must be celibate. For he had plainly said, It is not good for a man that he be alone. Genesis 2.18 Service for Jesus is most joyous when man and wife or vice versa can intimately share ups and downs. Imagine what fun... Paul could have had if he could discuss with a faithful, loving wife the situation in the church at Corinth. But whenever he thought forbidden in the 10th commandment, whenever the forbidden thought intruded, the 10th commandment intruded, Paul had to say very resolutely, no, no. Like the pricking of a thorn in the flesh, it was painful to keep reaffirming that decided no. And the Lord never took away that temptation. But the good news is that the grace of Jesus was sufficient to keep the man's soul happy, always, even through his tears. And maybe Paul even developed some sensitivity to the celibate solitude that Jesus has had to feel all this long time while he must wait until his bride finally decides to make herself ready for the marriage of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 7. Dearest Father in heaven, there are times in our lives when we feel alone and forsaken, and then our thoughts turn to Jesus, the one who was the son alone and forsaken, as it were, on the cross, who died for us, 
And then our faith is enhanced and strengthened to carry on hand in hand with our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.